I'm Carl King, and this is the Carl King Podcast, where we learn about music, filmmaking, and the other creative arts. To support this podcast, head over to patreon.com slash carlking and join for just $1 or $5 per month. Or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. Special thank you to my illusionist $51 level patrons, both Hank Howard III and Kahubid. Quick shout out to my music endorsements, Vienna Symphonic Library, Fractal Audio, Ernie Ballstrings, Tune Track, and Millennia Media. Now let's get this episode beginned. Very good friends of Carl King, I have just a few Carl King, the human updates. Number one, my prog metal and glockenspiel cover of Rebecca Black's Friday is now available to hear through YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, and of course Bandcamp. So go to those apps or websites and give it a listening. Number two, my friend Leanna Vamp and her team have released an animated teaser trailer for their show called The Fiends, spelled F-I-E-N-D-S. And I wrote an 80s synth music theme for it. You can find that on YouTube, and I will post a link in the show notes. And number three, I am in the process of scoring my new animated pilot, Dragon Tooth Inn. And after many technical issues of importing my voice actor and sound effects tracks into my gigantic orchestral scoring template in Cubase, I am now struggling with settling on a sound palette. I'm currently torn between using a big, traditional, orchestral fantasy sounding score and a tiny medieval ensemble with old, pitchy instruments. I'm unsure which way it will ultimately end up, or if it will be a combination of both. Anyway, I posted a rough mix, as well as the full-length script a while back, inside my Patreon account. So head over to patreon.com slash carlking and hear what there is to see. And now, let's officially get beginned with this week's filmmaking analysis. This week we've got Tim Burton's Wednesday, Episode 1, on Netflix. First of all, I believed this TV show was created by Tim Burton, but it was not. Tim Burton directed the first four episodes, but it was actually created and screenwrited by Alfred Gauff and Miles Millar. We at the Carl King Podcast would like to apologize for calling this segment Tim Burton's Wednesday, but it was not up to us. Now, Wednesday the character was performed by an actor named Jenna Ortega, and it was the perfect casting because she has a self-care routine that includes Pilates, and Wednesday is coincidentally the day I teach Pilates. I also did not realize until I looked it up but she is the same actor from the film X, which I reviewed in episode 38 of the Carl King podcast. And I suspect Jenna Ortega will go far in her career, having already been in solid roles at age 20. Overall, as can be expected, this is an expertly executed TV show. It looks good, and it sounds good. And it even has some music by an actual expert, Danny Elfman. So no problems there. Now, before I dig into any analytical commentary, I want to make this clear. If I had watched this TV show when I was a teenager, I would have idolized the Wednesday character. Not because she is a 90-pound goth girl, which I also was in high school, But because as a young adult, I loved movies about smart as heck and rebellious anti-heroes and outcasts. You know, underdogs who reject the mainstream. 
And in some cases, maybe they're straight-up criminals we might sympathize with. In the 80s, there was Pump Up the Volume, Heathers, Beetlejuice, Ferris Bueller, The Breakfast Club, and even Summer School with those characters Chainsaw and Dave, who wore trench coats and backwards baseball hats. And the Princess Bride and Dead Poet Society feel like they would also fit into that list of smart kid movies. In the 90s, there was Daria and Ghost World and Falling Down, Goodwill Hunting. And in the 2000s, there was V for Vendetta. And maybe Frank Zappa was a real-life version of this archetype. Those unconventional characters had the confidence to be themselves, even if they were uncool, according to the rest of society. They would see through the BS and weren't afraid to speak their minds. So I get it. I'm sure there are kids out there who will resonate with this character 100%. They'll point to Wednesday and say, that's totally me, or that's a part of me that I want to be more of. And probably the best purpose of this type of character is to reach out and connect with nonconformists and make them feel less alone. Or to sell Netflix subscriptions. We don't know yet. So anything I say about this show that might sound negative, it's all for the purposes of technical analysis. I like to start these segments out with what I call the implausibilities. So in the teaser which is about three minutes long, Wednesday puts plastic bags of piranhas in the school's swimming pool. And I'm no veterinarian, but I don't think piranhas would react well to being dumped into a chlorinated pool. And don't fish need to be temperature acclimated first? I remember I was always told to do that with my goldfish. You put the plastic bag into the fish tank for a while first, and... Let the temperature equalize so the fish aren't shocked when you let them out, I think. And the other problem is, according to Wikipedia, the reputation of piranhas eating people is kind of a myth. Quote, piranhas typically do not represent a serious risk to humans. Unquote. Huh. Well, now you might say, Carl King, this is a supernatural fantasy story. It doesn't need to be realistic. Okay then, I will let everyone know. There is a thing called Wells's Law, named after H.G. Wells's, and he was the author of War of the Worlds, and his law goes like this, quote, A science fiction story should contain only a single extraordinary assumption. As soon as the magic trick has been done, the whole business of the fantasy writer is to keep everything else human and real. Touches of prosaic detail are imperative and a rigorous adherence to the hypothesis. Any extra fantasy outside the cardinal assumption immediately gives a touch of irresponsible silliness to the invention. So basically what he's saying is, you get to have one big unusual thing, and that's it. That means in a Superman film, just because there's an alien with superpowers, it doesn't mean all the laws of physics can be broken at random in every scene. You know, you shouldn't add dragons and time travel and parallel universes because that stretches the premise too far. Also, Superman's powers should be consistent. Like he can't suddenly start using a new power later to conveniently get out of a problem. And everything else around Superman needs to remain normal or as the Upright Citizen Brigade calls it, base reality. So applying this to the piranhas, or is it piranha? Anyway, unless they were called out as super mutant piranhas, which Wednesday bred herself specifically to survive in chlorine and feast on bad people, I think Wells's law has been broken. Now, it's totally possible that is part of the backstory, and it was left out to save time. Maybe it is. We don't know yet. Aside from that, there was a good example of ironic counterpoint in the music during that scene. That French music as the piranhas are attacking. 
Because the on-the-nose instinct for a composer would be to write Jaws-type action music. And in this case, it was effective to go the opposite direction. So, good friends of Carl King, please remember that the next time you score a film. Now, let's talk about the character of Wednesday Adams, or is it Wednesday, perfectly executed by Jenna Ortega. I think the character could easily be wearing a Star Trek uniform and be a Vulcan, because Wednesday is 100% emotionless and hyper-intellectual, that archetype of the special gifted child, wise beyond her years, and she speaks with a non-stop dry wit and a straight-faced stare, and she makes no unnecessary motions, she's got this stiff posture, and basically behaves like a robot. And also, did anyone notice she never blinks? Because I suspect that is bad for her eyeballs. Seems like she's that classic, I'm a superior introvert, I hate small talk, and most people are stupid. And in a TV show or movie, those extreme personality traits are entertaining. But I bet if you met a real-life Wednesday, it might be frustrating. She's an exaggerated version of a person who is imprisoned in their prefrontal cortex. It's kind of an alpha nerd thing where they'll act like they don't know what figures of speech are and refuse to have an easy flow of conversation. Instead of showing interest in other people, interactions are just a chance to prove their cleverness. It's like they shift between either talking too little and freezing you out, or they use more words than are needed. And I think that comes from a need to prove how complicated they are like overplaying or wanking on a guitar. But instead of doodly doodly on guitar strings, it's talking in synonyms, calling people life forms and calling houses dwelling places and calling food sustenance and all of that. Like, look at me, I'm a thesaurus. I think it's a defense mechanism, an ego or persona some of us develop in response to a hostile environment or just a feeling that we don't belong. But as I said, a lot of people identify with that. I definitely would have in my previous life as a goth girl. Now, here's something that didn't add up, though. Wednesday's snarky comments convey that she is somehow evil or dark. But aside from dumping piranhas in the pool, the rest of the time she doesn't actually do anything that could be considered evil. So, her darkness is only a mostly visual, goth aesthetic. Some examples are when she says, I admire the sadism, but she rarely behaves sadistically. She says, I do like stabbing, but she never stabs anyone. She says, they feel like electroshock therapy, but without the satisfying afterburn. But we never see her enjoying electroshock therapy. She says, the only person who gets to torture my brother is me. But she doesn't torture her brother. She says, I see the world as a place that must be endured, and my personal philosophy is kill or be killed. But she doesn't kill anyone. So I think Wednesday might be all talk. And this show is full of her deadpan goth jokes. It's almost like the story was written as a vehicle for them. And here's something I noticed about the cinematography. I've never seen so much of this in my life. There are many close-ups and extreme close-ups on Jenna Ortega's face, as she does not a whole lot. I wonder, is it harder to play a non-emotional character? We don't know yet. There's also an unusual use of dialogue spoken directly into the camera. Normally looking directly into the camera is a no-no, except when intentionally breaking the fourth wall. But somehow, it felt mostly effective here. Still, I noticed it, so maybe it wasn't that effective. And let's talk about the story's setting. Instead of putting Wednesday in a normal school, it was a strong choice to put Wednesday in a school of misfit goth kids. And even there, she doesn't fit in. Why? Why does she not fit in there? I I don't know. I haven't been able to figure that out 
Exactly. Maybe because the kids at Nevermore behave the same as all teenagers? They're all just jerks? Except they happen to be vampires and werewolves? Overall, I think this concept gets kind of murky. For instance, when she arrives at the school, Wednesday is paired up with a blonde, bubbly, extrovert roommate who happens to be obsessed with rainbows, but is also a werewolf. It just seems to me that the setting was a clever idea that got all mixed up. The writers probably liked the idea of a goth girl who doesn't fit in even at a goth school, but then realized it wouldn't create enough conflict. Because who is she going to clash with? Okay, guys, we need a solution. Get out that shoehorn and add some more characters. Maybe as they were writing it, they painted themselves into a corner. Because there's also the blonde therapist and the nearby town full of people who hate the goth kids for some unknown reason. Because both groups are cruel and intolerant. Maybe it's too many points of conflict, like having three people in an arm wrestling match. Anyway, the whole episode felt a bit long. In my own personal, totally subjective opinion, they could have cut out 25% of it, because it felt like the same joke was repeated in every scene. Wednesday expressing that she's goth over and over. Yes, we know, we get it. You wear black and like the rain. Okay then, I will let everyone know. From a screenwriting perspective, there also seems to be a problem that our hero, or heroine, has no flaws. Wednesday is smart, she speaks multiple languages, is a virtuoso cellist, and she knows everything, even martial arts. So what is there for her to aspire to or overcome within herself? Is she already portrayed as perfect? Because I think that's what they were going for. But I only watched episode one, so maybe these questions are answered in future episodes, or future seasons, or future reboots. I think Michael Bay is actually doing a reboot of this show next year on HBO Max. Either way, I could not have done a better job making this show. So I would give this show 5 out of 5 stars on Letterboxd, but it's not on Letterboxd, because some TV shows are on Letterboxd, and some are not. And now, let's move on to the song analysis of the week. Years ago, I wondered what would happen if you were to play a guitar solo entirely with wrong notes. And what I mean is this. There are 12 chromatic notes. And if you play in a major or minor key, you have seven basic notes to choose from. And that leaves the other five that are not in the key. But what if you only play those five? What would that sound like? Well, Sarah Brand has written a pop song called Red Dress that answers this question. And if you haven't listened to it, this segment won't make much sense to you. So please, go give it a listen. I'll even put a link in the show notes. Or pop open YouTube and type Sarah Brand Red Dress. It is really something to hear. Now for the rest of you who know this song, let's put on our music theory socks and investigate. To explain what's happening, let's start with a basic C major chord. Over that chord, it would be considered in the key or diatonic to play these seven notes. C, D, E, F, G, A, B. But since there are 12 chromatic notes, that leaves the five black keys, like on a piano. D sharp, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, and C sharp. And those happen to form a pentatonic scale. And you could consider it a minor pentatonic scale starting a minor third above whatever key you're in. So in the key of C, you would play a minor pentatonic scale starting on D sharp or E flat, which are the same note and harmonically. Or you could consider it a major pentatonic scale starting on F sharp. And hey, 
That's a tritone up from C. Interesting, isn't it? Now, as you can hear, those notes don't feel like they belong. F sharp major pentatonic scale over a C major chord? Those are quite dissonant and outside the key, and that's because they're basically two keys at once. And the official term for this is bitonal, or two keys. Now, let's apply this to our selected song, Red Dress, by Sarah Brand. What makes this song sound so wrong? Well, first of all, the song is in the key of G. Those notes would be G, A, B, C, D, E, and F sharp. That's right, if you know your scales, the key of G, we only have one sharp, and that is F sharp. Now, the chord progression throughout the song is G major, D major, C major, and A minor. And that's kind of an odd chord progression, actually. It's a common group of chords, but they're in a slightly unusual order. Normally in tonal music, the chord progression would be more like G major, C major, A minor, and D major. And that would be a one, four, two minor, five. The five chord is usually placed as the last chord in the phrase before returning to one. But the order that this song plays the chords in, G major, D major, C major, A minor, which is a two minor chord at the end, returning to a one, adds a little bit to the lopsided sound, or at least creates a weaker cadence. And by the way, I'm not here to say which chord progression is good or bad. I'm only telling you which one is considered the norm according to Music Theory 101. Now, what really makes this song special is the note choices in the vocal melody. Now, you might listen to this song and think, wow, that is some bad, out-of-tune singing. And I'm here to tell you, the majority of the notes she sings are very in tune. I know this because I isolated the vocal melody from the rest of the music using Isotope RX, and I lined it all up with a piano in Cubase. And you can try this yourself if you have the software. After doing this, I would say that maybe 95% of the notes are not at all sharp or flat. They are in tune. So it's her actual note choices that sound wrong by creating dissonance over the chords. And now I'm actually going to go through it line by line, chord by chord. And here's the first example right from the beginning of the song, the first verse. Now, when she sings the words, I came to church, it's a G major chord. But the notes she sings are G sharp and A sharp. And that's a flat nine and a flat three. Or you could more properly consider them a sharp one and a sharp two, but that just seems bizarre to say. And I don't want to get into calling them flats, which would be an A flat and a B flat. So let's just stick with sharps and do our best here. Now realize neither of those notes belong over a G major chord. And neither of them are even in the key of G, which the song is in. Moving on to the words to praise all love, those are over a D major chord. And she sings a C sharp, D sharp, and E. And that's a seven, flat nine, and a nine over the D major chord. And two of those notes, C sharp and D sharp, are not in the key of G either. Now, if you isolate those two lines of melody, she's pretty much in the key of B flat or A sharp minor blues. And remember, the chords beneath it are in the key of G major. 
So right there, we have that black key trick. She is mostly using those five notes that don't belong intentionally, creating a bitonal piece of music. And the next phrase, sitting coming for, is over a C chord. And the vocal melody is F sharp, G sharp, A sharp. And do any of those notes belong over a C chord? Nope. However, that F sharp is the leading tone or major seventh in the key of G, but over the C chord, it's the scale degrees flat five, flat six, flat seven. And those are all so-called black keys over the chord. The next phrase, someone else, is over an A minor chord. And she sings the notes D, D sharp, and E, which would be the four or 11, sharp four or sharp 11, and the five over the chord, a chromatic line. It's pretty rough to land on an 11 over a minor chord. And the note she keeps emphasizing in that sort of superimposed B flat minor blues scale is the flat five, that E. And that D sharp is also not even diatonic to the key of G. Moving on, the next phrase, it didn't stew, is over a G chord. And the notes are D, E, and F sharp which in the key of G would be a five, six, and seven scale degrees. And if you listen to just that chord and section of melody, it creates a nice jazzy major seven tonality. But within the context of the chords that come before and after, our ear is already so bent, we can't even hear that jazz major seven for what it is. But the next phrase, well with me, is a D chord, and she sings the notes C sharp and D sharp, which in the key of D would be a seven and a flat nine again. And in the key of G major, those would be a sharp four and a sharp five, which means she is back on those so-called black keys again. The next phrase, but I said it was a, is a C chord with the notes D, F, G, C sharp, which are the nine, four, five, and flat two. And in the key of G, those would be a five, flat seven, one, and flat five. So two of those four notes are out of the key. And the final phrase I'll cover from the verse is lover's deed. That's an A minor chord with the notes C sharp and D sharp, which would be a major third and a sharp four. So she's creating a Lydian kind of thing over a minor chord, which totally clashes. And as always, the notes C sharp and D sharp are not in the key of G. And I wanna say this again, all of these notes she sings are completely in tune, chromatically. If you run them through a tuner, they'd come up in tune. In fact, her vocals without the music sound like they could be a Tori Amos song. Now, before we move into the chorus, there's a tag where she sings, because what they saw, and that previous A minor chord becomes an A major, which is sometimes called a Picardy third. And the notes of her melody are E flat, G sharp, A, and G. And over that A major chord, those scale degrees would be flat five, seven, one, and flat seven. It is a chromatic nightmare with a tritone thrown in. Remember E flat and G sharp are definitely not in the key of G. And those would be sort of those black keys we keep running into. Okay, moving into the chorus, it's those same chords as the verse. G, D, C, A minor. 
and miraculously, the melody of the chorus actually pretty much fits over the chord progression, and the main vocal still seems to be in tune. But to keep up the necessary level of dissonance, they added an out-of-tune vocal track doubling those in two vocals. Folks, folks, it's theoretically possible this song was simply the monkeys at typewriters thing that happened to output a bitonal avant-garde masterpiece. Or Sarah Brand and or her producer has an incredible ear for 20th century composition and should become an honorary member of Mr. Bungle. Here's my own subjective opinion. There's no way this song was made on accident. It's not just bad singing, because it is way too hard to sing random notes and have the majority of them land so cleanly on non-diatonic pitches. You know, if you play any note, you have a 58% chance of playing a note in key and a 42% chance of playing a note that is out of key. So that means you would need really bad luck to play mostly wrong non-diatonic notes. And on top of that, it's pretty hard to sing non-diatonic notes in tune at all. And I suggest you try it sometime. I think at the core, Sarah Brand is doing exactly what serious composers like Stravinsky and Charles Ives did with taking sing-songy folk music and injecting carefully chosen dissonant or wrong notes. And modern listeners are reacting in the same way classical music listeners reacted when they first heard 20th century composers. With anger. Now, Sarah Brand herself had this to say, quote, I wanted to find a way to create what I call a holistic music video experience. Now, what do I mean by that? Red Dress was about judgment. And so we follow this woman into a church community where she's met with exclusion and judgment. So how can I make the real world audience feel that judgment? Well, one, the vocals are out of place, just like that character. And two, the music video's music being out of place and out of key incite judgment from the real world audience. Well, there you have it. I am looking forward to seeing what Sarah Brand comes up with next. You can visit her website at sarahgbrand.com and I will put a link in the show notes. Okay, that's the end of this episode of the Carl King Podcast. Remember to subscribe on Spotify, Apple, or anywhere else you listen to these dang podcasts. And support the creation of more episodes by joining my Patreon for $1 or $5 per month. That's patreon.com slash carlking. Or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. And as always, special thanks to my $51 a month patrons at the Special Illusionist level Chubode and Hank Howard III. And thank you to all of the very good friends of Carl King for listening. And as I always say, okay then, I will let everyone know. <laughs>